Kenny, it is extremely exciting to have you here. I've known you for a long, long time. The sessions is about trying to bring information that you have done in your life and your successful career to this next generation, to give them information about how you have maintained and succeeded at what you've done. You have done the biggest, the best. It is incredible the wave that you've created, the movement you've created. Mm -hmm. Where did it all start for you when you were younger? How did drums get involved in the passion for music? Well, my parents always had jazz on the turntable, so I was always hearing music or, sh or classical or show tunes. But one day I was, there was nothing to watch on TV when we were kids. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? We had a black RCA TV with the rabbit ears and the tinfoil on the yeah, rabbit ears so. <laughs> to, get, to, to get better reception. Yeah. These kids are going, what are you guys talking about? Anyway, there was nothing to watch on TV, so we always were playing outside. Me and my brother, one day my mom was saying, you got to get in here. you got to come in here. And we thought, oh, my God, what do we do? And the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show. 1964, Four. you saw that show. What did that show, as it did for many people, what did it do for you? Well, I mean, I, I had never, that was the most exciting thing in my life. It was like a drug. It was like, I was like, it was crazy. It was like there was nothing as stimulating as that. Yeah. So I just, li I literally turned to my mom and said, I want to be in the Beatles, call them up. <laughs> I mean, and she didn't say anything, <laughs> of course. And then I'm looking and I'm going, you know, I saw the drums. I didn't see the other stuff. I mean, I saw them, but, you know, I was just drawn high energy. Yeah, yeah. Drums, energy, and I was just that guy. I was wired to do that. So then I said, Mom, I want a drum set. Definitely silence. <laughs> and then uh, I said, I want to grow my hair. I want to do that. I want the girls going crazy for me. And I want that. And she obviously didn't call the Beatles. So I started a band two weeks later, and I, I went, uh, my mom went to Manny's, and got a, a snare drum yeah. and, and said, this is crazy. She says, well, I don't know if my son, I mean, we can't afford it. They couldn't afford to get a drum set. So it was just a snare drum and a cymbal. I stood up and played. And um, she said, well, I don't know if my son's going to stick with it. She said, Mrs. Aronoff, if your son doesn't like this, you can bring the drum back. We'll give you your money back. Oh, that's incredible. Isn't that incredible? So anyway, yeah, I had a band and then... So this is a band of just people in the area. Was your brother? You have a twin brother. Was yeah. he was he involved with music at all? Yeah, yeah. Well, we he was taking piano. Eventually, through high school and grade school, we were in bands, and he would play piano. Eventually, he got a B three and the Farfisa. So we nice. did Doors music. Nice. You know, we just we. But I was self taught. There was nobody teaching rock and roll drums in the in the in, in Western Mass where I grew up. Yeah. You know, it was like three thousand people, and this was this new thing, rock and roll thing. And <laughs> so we we just get together on the weekends and self taught and. And then, um, the, the, I'll jump ahead, the, the amazing thing about my story, which is awesome, is that 50 years later... I, I saw the show. ...got to play with the Beatles, honoring them for the Ed Sullivan show. And it was, it was the same day that they had yeah. performed 50 years earlier, on that Sunday yeah. evening, on the same channel yeah. that it was on, <laughs> and I'm watching this, I'm seeing you on drums, and I'm going, this, and I knew the story about yeah, you, right. and I'm going, my gosh, well, how do you even, this is a movie. Exactly. This, the, you, your life really has that movie element to it. Yeah, it was perfect. It was like it bookends like a person. How, especially in this business, yeah. which I don't mean to jump ahead, but staying relevant is one of the most difficult things. That, this is one of the most difficult businesses in the world. It's like you go to law school, you get a, a, a degree in law, and you can pretty much practice law yeah. or med school. Right. You get a degree in classical music or music, yeah. doesn't guarantee you anything. Absolutely. Nothing. Absolutely. But that's you know, the relevancy thing, which you have mastered, which we'll get to in a second. Mm -hmm. Classical music. So you went eventually and studied classical music and classical percussion. Yeah, because I, there was no, like I said, there was no school of rock back then. Right, right. You know, you remember, and it was like, and so the Boston Symphony Orchestra was three miles away, and there was some kid in my town that was getting better, and I went, wow, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm studying with Arthur Press, the principal percussionist from Boston Symphony Orchestra. So I went for a lesson. I mean, this was, there's no hand-holding or coddling here. Yeah. There's no entitlement laziness in this picture. Yeah, absolutely. He said, What's your name, son? I went, Kenny? He says, Kenny what? Kenny Aronoff. He says, what have you prepared for me today? I'm like, what? I never heard that before. <laughs> prepared for you? I didn't know I was supposed to. He says, do you, do, you know, do you have a mallet piece? I went, what are mallets? Oh, man. You see, I was like, I was in a rock band. I wasn't yeah. doing any. There was nobody to teach me marimba. Or, yeah. uh, so I went, I don't, and then, you know, I was going, yeah. And then he goes, well, have you prepared a timpani? Piece. I went, I don't play timpani. I was starting to get smaller and smaller. Finally, he goes, what do you play? And I went, 
drums. He says, well, then let's go down and play some drums. He put on Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Spinning Wheels. Oh, my God. Now, at least I'd been jamming to it. Yeah. But I was, like, not educated. And so I started playing in about 30 seconds. He grabbed me off by my shirt off the stool and pointed to a rubber pad, <laughs> practice is. pad. And, and that the was, journey began. The journey began. This guy was all about discipline, hard work. There was no hand-holding. It, it was like you, you show up, and if you're not prepared, you'd be yelled at. And, and he was, he, this guy fought. He grew up in New York, didn't have a lot of money. The parent, family didn't have money. To be a, a musician was a huge honor, and, and they expected him to be a businessman to help support the family. Right, so right. when he said, I'm going to Juilliard, they were like, music? Yes. So to him, it was an honor and not to be treated lightly. Right. And I, I have no idea why I didn't say, heck with this, I'm, you know, I'm going to go. Because, I mean, back when I was a kid, I was into sports, rock and roll, um, and girls. I mean, I was just a normal kid. So, yeah. so yeah. why would I want to be with this guy who's going to be drilling me and, and make me nervous all week before I take a lesson or it, during the year, it was every month until the summer when the Boston Symphony Orchestra came up. Anyway, the bottom line is that was the foundation of discipline and hard work that stayed with me. I didn't know what was happening, but this was what But was that's happening. a powerful tool for the message to be shared in this Good. discussion right now Good. because hard work, discipline, you know, preparation, yeah. that was the beginning skill that has absolutely yeah. helped you in what you're doing right now. Absolutely. And when I wrote this book, uh, you know, Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, I, you know, it made me go back and reflect. I don't, I don't like, I'm so hyper and I'm always thinking, I'm always forward thinking. Forget about what I did. Right. Forget about all that. I mean, I could tell you, I mean, it's millions of records sold. There's a list of artists it's that ridiculous. it's, it's mind-boggling. But I don't, I don't think about that. All I'm thinking is about what am I doing now and tomorrow? I just wired that way. So what, and with, the, with my DNA, the, the energy I have, I have been able to perpetuate a huge career. Anyway, the thing was, we all went to college as kids, so I decided I'd pick music, and I was behind in the skills of, you know, I, I wasn't in a marching band, I wasn't right. in any orchestra. So certain but, techniques, you didn't have them down. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I wasn't, you, I wasn't, I didn't have my theory together, I didn't have my reading skills together. Yeah. So the summer after I got out of high school, everybody's partying, what they usually do before they go away to college, yeah. I was practicing eight hours a day. Absolutely. Scared to death, because I knew I was going to be behind. So I was practicing mallet, two hours on mallets, two hours on timpani, two hours on legit snare, and two hours on drum set for my own. Right. And I was playing in a jazz trio five nights a week. That, Arthur Press, to that, Arthur Press taught me discipline, the practicing taught me hard work, right. fueled by passion, which is the, the desire to be great, and there was a little fear there. I was like scared I was going to but be behind. fear is also a motivating factor. Absolutely. It, it, it really is. It kind of pushes you forward to realize that there are people that are going to be better than you. That's just how it's yeah. going to be. Oh, yeah. But the driving force to try to achieve more, to the inspiration to yeah. attain that level of... Absolutely, man. So it, it, the, the pace of learning. You've listened to a wide variety of music. I mean, I've seen you play jazz, right. small group, big band, right, right. rock, funk, Latin. Yeah. I mean, you really have that incredible scope. How would you fuel that? Dude, let me tell you something. I got teased by people when I was in you are in a Indiana University, I eventually ended up at Indiana number one classical school in the country. Yeah. You know, they're really intense program. They try to they'll try to wash you out so that they always have the best mu right. musicians graduating. Right. It's kind of Navy SEAL approach. Yeah. And I was perfect for that program. I was at the bottom and worked my way to the top. I mean I'm the guy, the tortoise. I'm the guy that just pounded my way in the end zone like a running back. He right. doesn't score right. every time but he keep pounding all I am focused on is the end zone. So anyway, um, when I graduated from that school, I uh, I got I fulfilled the American dream, which was oh I know what I was talking about yeah. about all the different styles. The classical guys made fun of me for playing bebop right. upstairs. The bebop guys, jazz guys, made fun of me doing classical. Both made fun of me playing rock. Right. And then I I play at a VFW, some corny <laughs> private parties. You did anything. It all. Yeah, yeah. R and B bands. Fusion bands, anything. So you were looking for experience. I just want, I loved playing the drums. I yeah, love yeah. all music. Yeah. I just love it. It feels good mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, every single way. It was all positive. So why wouldn't I want to do that? And why wouldn't I want, the bottom line is it took a long time, but eventually it, that gave me a foundation to be a great session player because on, I mean, I was doing the Highwaymen 
one, this is one scenario I was doing the Highland, which is Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, and Waylon Jennings. Yeah. Real heavy principle, classic country guys. Right. Whole different way of playing the drums. You don't bury the beater in the head, you don't hit a rim shot, you hit the center of the drum, play light on the hi-hat, you support the bass tones. I mean, it's a whole different, you play in the middle of the beater, in the back of the, toward the back. And then at night I was doing meatloaf, which was <laughs> slamming yeah. the drums and you're just driving the band. And I mean, and then I'd be doing with B.B. King and then I'd be with Tony Iommi from Sabbath. Then I'd be with Michelle Branch and Avril Lavigne. Then I'd be with the Rolling Stones. And be, I mean, it was just all over the place. And so it took a long time, but that education of be, wanting to play all these different styles authentically. Right. Like right. I didn't, yeah, Kenny showed up at all those gigs, but I looked at it like a musicologist and went, all right, I got to try to be as authentic at this style as possible. And that ended up building this ability to do anything. Absolutely. You, know, you, mentioned, you mentioned about mentally, spiritually, you know, physically and, and, yeah. and, and, emotionally. and emotionally. Talk about that for a second. I mean, that's an important balance to have. Those four areas, if they're in balance, you can move forward in anything that you want in your vision. You've always had your eye on the prize. You've been clear, you've been focused. How did that develop? Is that something that is, is your DNA wired that way? Is it your genes, what, what is I it? I think so, I think, uh, well, some of it's DNA. You know, you're born uh, with a certain spirit and vibe. I, I just naturally want to be towards the positive, upbeat, happy. I like to, f if I, f I like to feel happy. I don't like to yeah. feel down. Yeah. So I naturally go that direction. But I also had great upbringing where in my family, it was, it was all yes, there was no no. No was out of the right. equation, right. unless you were bad, <laughs> which I did a lot of that. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, and I have a twin brother, so we were like heckling jekylls running around. <laughs> all of it was basically, we were kicked out of the house so that we, they'd have peace and quiet <laughs> in a nice, loving way. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think that when I play the drums, like every time, no matter what, even if I'm sick, I always go, God, this feels good. Yeah, yeah. It, it physically feels good, and then your adrenaline gets going, then you chemically feel good, and then I love music, and that, I think, is, I'm just born that way. I can't say that I went, I want to learn how to love right, music. Right. I just, it's just the, the, the sounds, the feel, the tones, the melodies, and I love sharing it with other people. Mm. In the band, and the audience, because yeah, yeah. there's this energy between me and the band, me and the audience, the band and the audience, and it goes out that way and then it comes back. Right, right, right. It's a great, that's what I love. If people say, what if you had to pick between live or the studio, and I hate that, because yeah, yeah. I love recording, I would say live if I had to because of that Energy that between the art and his magic. Yeah, it's there's magic. electricity there. And how, I love that feeling. How, how do you keep yourself? I mean, you're, you're in great shape, you, and, and I know you have steps of, yeah. of physical eight, eight steps. steps. Of, talk about the eight steps. Well, the eight steps, okay, well, I'll back up just a teeny bit and I'll try to not say a lot of words about it. When I wrote the book, I, 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 like I told you, I always look forward. I, I had to look back and go, like, well, if I had to explain to somebody how I did this, how would you do that? And it took a long time. And I finally came up with seven ways that I believe people can be successful and stay successful. Right. Key word is stay successful. Absolutely. And this sixth step, the sixth step is called a healthy life is a wealthy life. Right. So I talk about you have to be mentally, physically, and emotionally healthy. Right. Any one of those can stop you from doing what Absolutely. you're doing. You'll crash. Absolutely. You're, you're done. Yeah. So like yeah. it doesn't matter all these business techniques and all these things I talk about, self-discipline and hard work and all this stuff is meaningless if you're not healthy, you, right. you're paralyzed. So I came up with, just to be broad, I came up with eight steps of being healthy. One is, I can list them and describe them a little bit, it depends Absolutely. on, okay, yeah, yeah. lifting weights. And I mean, obviously I lift weights, but I'm not trying to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, but the benefits of lifting weights is that it keeps your hormone levels up, which fights off the big three, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. It also makes you strong and it also makes you feel good. It, hormones give you a positive chemical thing too. Right. So it's just all great, okay? And the second one is cardio. Now cardio, most important thing about cardio is it exercises the most important muscle in your body, the heart. I don't know about you, but I heard when the heart goes, you're kind of dead. <laughs> so you can't play the drums when the heart goes. So when I started researching that, I went, oh. I mean, I always knew it, but I went, holy, 
I'm doing cardio. <laughs> <laughs> and so, by the way, when your hormone levels up, it fights off not just cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. It, it just keeps you healthy, fights off disease. So, like, I, I flew from Berlin yesterday, Germany. I did a show with John Fogarty and then flew right to Nam. You know, I slept on the plane. But when I was in the airport at 4 in the morning after only an hour and a half, I started to feel a little feverish like because I, I hadn't slept. I started doing push-ups, and it brought my adrenaline up, and I suddenly felt not feverish. I felt strong. Okay, number three is stretching. So you've got strength. Now this is flexibility. You know, yoga is a great example. And when I lift weights after a set, I do these stretches. So if you're lifting like this and you're starting to tighten like this, I stretch out like that. Right. It's just a, it makes sense. You stretch your body out so you have flexibility and strength. Fourth thing is diet, and I could spend hours on that. It's not just what you eat, it's really what you don't eat. 85% right. of the way I look is diet. Mm. I'm aware, if I do eating something wrong, at least I tell myself, you shouldn't be doing that. Right. So diet is like, you know, basically you stay away from, you know, refined sugars and processed foods. Listen, when so, they've never opened up a body in the hospital and gone, yep, he had six pieces of broccoli. <laughs> Didn't he know that you should only have five? <laughs> six will kill you. Nobody dies from too much vegetables. So, I mean, like, that's an example of, like, lots of vegetables, some fruit, not too much because that's got sugar in it, yeah. but lots of vegetables and fruit is a great foundation. I still eat meat you know, red meat, fish, and chicken, but I don't eat as much red. I eat the highest quality I can get, but I, most of what I eat around it is vegetables. Right, right. You know, and, and, and you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but if you drink soda, which is really popular, that's the number one thing a doctor will ask you if you're sick, are right. you drinking soda? Because there's no nutrients that are good for Absolutely. you in there, and it feels that sugar, the sugar feeds and caffeine, disease. it all just kind of kind of gets in, and just there's no it, good that comes out of it. Interesting. It feeds. Let me tell you. Want to go hardcore? Cancer cells love the sugar. Yeah. Basically, cancer cells open their mouths, and you drink your soda. They're just going, <laughs> and you're feeling. It's a war in your body of of good of of of, of good uh, things and bad things. Yeah, yeah. Cancer's bad. Well, you got to build that immune system up. So, vegetables and fruit build that up. Things like soda and pure sugar feed these guys. It's just an army fighting each other in there. Anyway. So you maintain this on the road and you're, yeah. you're this way. I so carry protein powder and super green food. Right. The fifth thing is supplements. That's what I'll have on the road, like a lot of fish oil, a great multiple vitamin, uh, extra D, D complex actually fights off disease. It's like, a, like getting a, 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 a flu shot almost. It's yeah. like really, really good. And I take these things and the green food and a clean uh, protein powder, at least I'll have that in the morning. I know in a hotel, okay, I try to get Berries, because berries are antioxidants and Absolutely. they fight Great. disease. Berries, um, if I'm going to have carbs, I'll have like oatmeal is good, but then I'll have like protein, like eggs, poached eggs, uh, maybe one piece of bread. If I have oatmeal, no bread, because I don't want to have too much carbs, right. that puts on weight. Right. Now, if I'm playing a lot and doing like these, you know, three hour sound check and three hour show, I can eat more carbs and my body needs it. You're exerting energy, you're burning yeah. it out. Beautiful. And I try to get the healthiest bread. Or at least oatmeal is really good, and then um, and then that's pretty much the breakfast thing. I do drink coffee. Coffee's actually good for you. It stimulates the brain, mm -hmm. gives you a little bit of, and the brain. I mean, that's another thing. The heart goes, but the brain goes. You're yeah, dead. Absolutely. Stimulates the brain. How many fingers do I have? Up two or one? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that supplements. Then the, the sixth one is water. Now water, check this out, feeds every organ in your body. You, you're, every organ in your body, you need water to get oxygen in your blood to your brain. I mean, right. every organ. Now, you, you can live without food around 40 days, but three days without water, you're dead. Right. Your, your, your kidneys shut down, your lung, everything shuts down. So water, a great rule of thumb is take half your body weight. Let's say I was 200 pounds. Half of that is 100. Have 100 ounces of water. I don't do that. I'm a little bit weak on that part. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll make up for Kids it right drink now. water, not beer. <laughs> you'll make up for it right now. <laughs> mm. Water's great. Okay, then that's number seven. This is a good one I have to work on. Sleep. Because sleep actually repairs your body. I'm not the greatest. I, I wake up after three and a half hours, four, but I make myself, even if I have to read or do a little bit of work, I stay in bed and make myself sleep, but I try to get another three. Right. 
I'm not, I'm just not a great sleeper. Yeah, myself either. But, yeah. but that's, but that's, and that's part of our crazy schedule. Our, yeah. brain, our brain is so wired. Yeah. Like I was on the plane, I slept seven hours on the plane on the way back. And I remember I, I could wake up and watch me. I went, no, 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 stay down, get this sleep. You're going to need it. Yeah. So I'm, I now tell myself. And the last one, number eight, is meditation. Meditation, if nothing else, releases stress. Stress is not good for you. Absolutely. Stress is not healthy. Stress creates bad health. Yeah. So anyway, those are the big eight. So in, in, in putting the book together, what inspired you to write the book? I mean, here you are traveling and, and working and you're intensely busy at what you're doing. How'd the book come about? I didn't want to write the book. I was being interviewed by, for a Joe Satriani book and the, 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 the writer who's interviewing me said, I want to do your book. And I went, man, I'd love to, but I, I really don't have time to do this. Mm. He, said, he made it sound like, well, you just dictate some stuff to me and then it's, you get an Oscar. <laughs> At least that's what my brain thought. <laughs> you know, nothing in life works like that. Nothing. So I, I went, sure, I'll, I'll follow you. So I started writing. And what Jake Brown was the guy. He was really great. And, and then I started, oh, I know what it is. I found he was, the questions were all over the place. And then I went, wait a minute, we got to do this chronologically. I had it saved... Uh, calendar uh, calendar books, you know, uh, day, 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 day planners, yeah, yeah. And I had every session, every gig, just so I could keep track of it since 1977. Mm. I kept them. I found them so I could uh, log every year in the, and we started interviewing like that. Mm. Once I got all the stuff back, started reading it, and it, it, it didn't sound like me. Mm. So then I took over. This is the part yeah. I was worried about. I had to now take over, and okay. now I was putting in 14, 16 hours a day on days off because I was getting, you know, like, uh, you know, Hal Leonard was going, dude, you, you got a deadline. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so finally, the 600 pages are going to hand in, so we're six months late, and I call up Hal Leonard, and I actually had a checkbook in this hand, and I had the phone here, and I'm talking to uh, um, John Cirillo, and I went, <laughs> You know him? I said, John, how much is it going to cost to buy this book back? I, I don't like it. It doesn't sound like me. This thing sucks, you know. Oh, sorry. Beep, beep. This thing's bad. I don't like this book. I want to buy it back. And I mean one because I had Mellencamp interview, John Mellencamp, who had worked, John Bon Jovi, Melissa Etheridge, Billy Corgan from the Pumpkins. And I was nervous that they were, I can't put this out. John said, listen, listen. So you guys didn't know anything about writing a book. I said, listen. This is just this stage. We're going to get an editor for you, and then we take the 600 pages because your book is 300 pages too long. You got to shrink it down into the proper length, which is around 300 pages right. for the just like a three and a half minute song is the perfect length. But absolutely. But I didn't know this. And it's like when you make movies, they shoot all this film and then they sh shape it. And sometimes they move that scene there and they move that scene there to create this thing that the human mind will This flow enjoy. that the mind could understand, right. absolutely. So this was, the, I met with a guy in New York and I'm like, really, like, oh, I don't know about this. Met the guy, loved him enough to let him say, here's three chapters, go. And he, he did, it was amazing. He, he chopped stuff out, but it did flow. It, it just kept your, your attention. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I, without getting into detail, I learned all about book writing. I continued to write. I, basically, I touched every page of that book and then when I got closer to the end, I mean, the day I had to hand it in, I changed the cover. Yeah. It was the same picture, but I just was like, this looks amateur. And I was like, and they were going like, well, we think it's fine. I said, let me say something. I'm not Mick Jagger, but would Mick Jagger like that cover? And they went, I don't know. I said, no, he wouldn't. He would not like it. I'm not Mick Jagger, but I want Mick Jagger to like it. Yeah. Yeah. And so then I got with an art, someone recommended me to this really heavy artist who'd done like, you know, big covers of magazines. And he was a painter. He took it and immediately turned it to black and white, made the definition. And we spent two weeks on the font and every little letter and every little thing. Yeah. No such sex, drums, rock and roll. We took the and out because it didn't, it visually didn't fit anywhere. Right, right. So stuff like that, the, the, the discographies, I, I what a pain in the butt. Yeah. I had kept all my charts from the 80s, but in all CDs uh, with what songs I played on, but then I stopped doing that, or actually my uh, second wife helped me with that. She was really good at that, but the problem is is that you go online now, it's hard to see, get, you don't see credits right. anymore for right. what we've done. Absolutely. It's really sad, so then I went, wait a minute, 
this is going to go away. I want to make sure. This is like a, almost a historic book. I mean, a book, history book on drumming. I want to catalog this period of time. So I, I did like two weeks of intense research on trying to find out all the records I'd played on and what songs they played on. You can't see uh, this stuff tedious. anymore. And you know, years ago when we were younger, we had, we had you know, an LP yeah. that had information on it about the album, who played on it. Yeah. It was really very, very informative. It's not there right now. And CDs, it got to the point where the, it's, they go like drums, Kenny, Aronoff, Vinny Caliuta. Well, which tracks did they play on? Right, right. And now it's right. so small, you don't see now, it's like nobody cares. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I was really, every inch of that book I was, I, I, I touched and I'm so glad it's done. Yeah. It took four years. It was supposed to be two, well, because I'm so busy working. But I learned so much about my life yeah, yeah. by doing it. And that's what came, made me come up with these seven ways to be successful and stay successful. And just run down those, just run down those briefly, you know, seven different ways. Because this is an experience that you have hit the road. You know, wisdom is the combination of knowledge and experience. Right. Knowledge alone does not give one wisdom. Right. What you've done, you know, it's, the, it's putting that, that knowledge into action that mm -hmm. creates experience. Mm -hmm. You have an abundance of that. What are the seven points? Just briefly, just go down these okay. seven. Seven, the seven points. Days. The first one is self-discipline. It all starts there. Basically, okay. self-discipline is doing something you don't really want to do, yeah. but you get the results that you want. Self-control. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Second one is hard work, which is like that's like a car that gets you somewhere, or a plane, or a bike, or yeah. walking. Transportation through life. Hard work fueled by passion, yeah. which is I love music right, right. and drumming and people, and that's the fuel, action fueled by education. Right. A few, uh, Hard work fueled by passion and education because education you've got to keep learning, yeah. otherwise you just go down. Yeah. Okay, number three is executing a plan that you have. Create a plan that you execute to reach your goal. Yeah. It's like, uh, and I did that. I'm in my fourth, uh, my fourth goal in life. You know, e example of executing a plan: go to school, learn a trade, which was you know, classical music, right. and then get a job in the field that you studied. Right. That's the American dream. Right. That's what our dads did. That's what my mom, our moms did. I did that. I just decided I still wanted to be in the Beatles, so I s created a new plan and executed that, and four years later I get in the John Mellencamp band, which is my Beatles, right, right. where I'm making records and touring the world. Right. So right. You, you create a plan that you actually, now here's what I tell people. A lot of people have ideas, but they don't know what to do. I said, if you do nothing, you get nothing. Zero equals zero. Yeah. It's a math equation. No matter nothing how you do gets it. you nothing. Just That's it. even if you take one step a day, make one phone call, at the end of the year you've done more than zero. And sometimes when you're taking action, you go, you know what, I don't really want to do that. I want to do that. So taking action led you to your next goal. I mean, doing nothing gets you nothing. Get got to do something. Absolutely. Talk to people, meet people, get on the internet, anything, but network. nothing is nothing. Network, network, and make it happen. Yeah. So that's three. Number four is um, team communication skills, which do, somebody asked me, uh, asked uh, me, but they asked the guy, a uh, big producer, Don Wazza Husband, he says, why Kenny Aronoff? And that's a weird question. Why Kenny Aronoff? What do you mean? Why? He says, why would you hire him and not him? And he was in LA and I was living in Indiana. He says, Every, there's lots of great drummers, and there is, yeah. but there's this other element, which is the ability to get along with people, to be able to read a situation, to be a team player, to make things better for everybody by your contribution as a human being and energy and you know personality. And a great example was apparently, I didn't know this, I was probably out flirting with the receptionist <laughs> in a session, <laughs> me of all people, right? And I come into this room, it's an Iggy Pop set recording, and everybody, I come in, I'm like, let's go, let's rock, yeah! I'm pumped, and apparently, they were all down. Iggy was down because we were gonna do a John Hyatt song, and John Hyatt was in the next room recording, ironically, and they were eating, I'd been eating, and I went probably talk to the receptionist, and John just was burnt. He left, and Iggy thought he defended him, so he was really down. I come busting through there and changed the whole dynamic of the room. I didn't know about this till I read the book, my own book, the interview. Don said, "Yeah, Kenny saved my session." That's when I realized, okay, casting people right. is so important. I he says I need to have Kenny on my sessions or on my live gigs. 
because he saves my sessions, he motivates the room. That's a level of compassion, Kenny. Compassion is to feel what other people feel. To be sensitive enough to have that skill, that's a huge skill to have. Yeah, it is, it really is. I didn't, I wasn't aware of it because I was just doing it. Yeah. But then when you become aware of it, you realize, wow, this is really. That goes really, back to your upbringing. Yeah, yeah. It definitely is. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky, that's, yeah, my upbringing and my DNA, but now I'm aware of it. Yeah. Now I go, you know, if you ever, not in a good mood, that's when you become professional. Right. You go, you know, you're having a bad day. You know, if you ever, I'm sure people out there have had that day where like everything anybody says seems wrong or negative or bugs you. When it gets to the point where everybody's bugging you, it's you. Yeah. It's like you're just having a bad day. Yeah. So let it go. Yeah. You haven't, your chemistry's right, wrong or you didn't sleep enough, you ate the wrong things. Um, so it, it's important to identify that because then you, it isn't them. You realize it's me. Okay, I'm just having this weird day. I'll get through it tomorrow. It'll be a better day. And you, it, that's why it's important to understand this stuff. Yeah. So that's number four. Number five is this thing I call, you're going to love this one. This is so you. <laughs> RPS. Repetition of anything yeah. is the preparation for success. Huge. You want to be a great baseball player, you swing yeah. that bat 1,000 times a day. Yeah. Same way. And you get better. Same way. And we're human. We're not robots. So where's this thing? So if I do, if I do that on a pad every day for, let's say, an hour, yeah. when I get on the drum set, I can do or my feet. I'm, I'm not, a, I have to do that every day so that I can do that every day. Beautiful. And a pitcher, um, there's a guy, there's this golfer, Jason Day, who won seven um, PGA tournaments in 10 months in America, you know, America. He practices six hours a day, seven days a week, even when he's winning. Yeah. He keeps it going. So repetition of anything. And I, this applies to raising a family, too. I can reply as a, a, a mother who's raising kids. The repetition of her skills whatever it is to raise a family, feed them right, discipline, get them to school, do the, help them with their homework. The repetition of those skills makes her better too. Have, to have consistent rules that you stand by yeah. and you abide by, then they know the boundaries. Beautiful. Yeah, and this, yeah. this is so, it doesn't, it's not just about this. It, all these steps I'm talking about are not just for to be a great musician or a great businessman. It's for everybody. It's for whether you're mowing lawns, you got a painting business, you work for Microsoft, you're a drummer, right. you're a football player, you're a teacher, you're a housewife. These things are making your life better to be, become successful at what you're doing and keep you successful. Okay, number, that's five. Number six, healthy life is a wealthy life, and I gave you the eight steps. Correct. Number seven, finally, is staying focused so you can be relevant in this world that's right. changing by the second. Absolutely. I mean, okay, so a lot of people, it would be like getting in an airplane. You know, you get got all this fuel to get up there. You're in the sky. We've made it. But if the gas goes away, the plane goes down. <laughs> You gotta keep fueling yeah. the plane. Yeah. So I mean, I that's part. These seven things I think have made me stay successful in this crazy business. When you know, and so the relevancy is you listening to more music, you learning your craft more, you you just filling yourself with information. Yeah, and here's check this out. Here's a real good example of being relevant. I saw the budgets change in the recording business because yeah. somebody said, "Hey, if you happen to be in L.A.," because I was living in Indiana. I went, what do you mean if I happen to be that? Are the budgets changing? Because usually just fly you. Yeah. I'd be in first class. I'd get a rental car. I'd get a per diem fancy hotel. Right, right. All expenses taken. They'd fly me anywhere in the world, even just to do one song. And that led to other stuff. Well, the budgets went because when selling, when people stopped buying CDs and LPs or stopped buying music, there was no money coming. Any business needs to make money Absolutely. to then reinvest in the company, right. into artists. That's how I made it with Mellencamp. There was a budget to get our music recorded, a small salary for the band to live. Then when the record came out, I could spend a million dollars to get it placed on radio, to get us on TV, to magazines, tour support. It took millions of dollars. But in the end, that investment paid off because John Mellencamp obviously got better at songwriting, better at touring, and we became an arena rock band. Right. And, but it took money. That money's gone. So... I realized, so I moved to LA. That was one way of being relevant. Got an apartment. Right. Then I eventually moved completely. Then I saw the, the studios were so expensive, I had to get my own studio. Mm. And I could charge uh, a, a reasonable fee 
that was proper for me and the people wanting me in the world we live in now. I had to adjust and be relevant without selling out, you know, to adjust to the system. But you adapted your business into the yeah. business that was changing. Yeah. This is beautiful, Kenneth, because yeah. this is really where most people fail. Yeah, because of, think of a guy like me. I'm on 1,300 gold, platinum, uh, uh, diamond records, okay? 300 million records without downloads that I've been on that have been sold. Now, I could sit there and go, well, man, this is the way it goes. No, man, I'm not running this show. I'm just a piece of the show. So when it, so yeah, I got my little humble studio yeah. that people come, and when a kid comes in that's paying me, and I mean, even if, if Elton John walked in, I made more records than he has. <laughs> you know, I could sit there and go, let me tell you something. <laughs> I work for them, man. Yeah. I really, yeah, I got all this experience, but zip it, you're there to serve them. It's not my band, it's not my record, I'm not the artist, I work for them. But that's a level of professionalism that you fine-tuned. Yeah, and that keeps you relevant. It, that, you, you inspired me to say that because you were saying, this is where people, a lot of people fail. I'm saying I could have that big ego and say, well, no, but then I wouldn't be working. Right, absolutely. If I don't like the game, just switch the game. But yeah. I like the game, I still want to, for the rest of my, if, you, if Michael Jordan came in here right now, it doesn't matter if you have 60 businesses. He's a basketball player. You want to see him dribble. Right, right. I'm a drummer. Yeah. So, you know, I do speaking and I, I do this and I do that. But I'm a drummer. And that's my brand. That's what I am. And I love being a drummer. Right. So it's very important to maintain that. And if I have to make some adjustments, I make adjustments. This whole process came about from your hard work, your dedication, yeah. fueled by your passion. This yeah. passion that you felt for music that just continues with you. How do you keep this passion burning? Oh, How do you keep this fuel just going on yeah. as you have, listen, I've known you a long time. I know. You've always been this driven. Where's, what's the ingredient for that? Where's it come from? That's the million dollar question. That's like the, that's, that's the question that everybody asks me. Some of it is DNA, you know, I just, I have to say, I, and I don't like to tell it to too many people because I don't want people to feel like, well, I don't have the DNA. But what I, I do have, obviously, uh, an excitable personality and I, I just love life and I'm, uh, and I love music. And I, I think that basically I, I'm so, it makes me feel so good to do what I do, yeah. mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that there's nothing that makes me feel like that. I, I just, I'm driven. If yeah. that makes me feel good, I'm willing to work my ass off, self-discipline, bust my butt off, even at four in the morning until I fall asleep, so so I can feel, play good the next day, which makes me feel good yeah. about myself. And it makes me feel good that other people appreciate me. And the whole thing is just a way to get through life. And I love it. And, and so that's what may, I'm willing to bust my ass to feel this great about being alive. I have two choices, live or die in this planet. I want to live and I want to get the most out of this life. I don't know what's coming next, but I know something is. <clears throat> and I want to get the most out of this life every day, every minute. I'm aware of it now that I'm 22. And, uh, <laughs> and so, yeah. Now what I tell people who may not have my hyper, super, you know, adrenalized personality is I try to encourage them to, to do to feel as much passion as they can in their own body and life and mind and spirit, you know. It's just, some people, you know, there are ways that you can bring that out. Surround yourself by positive people like absolutely, you. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, yeah. I, I know somebody, I won't mention who, but who came from a family who was like, no, you can't do that. Nope, you can't do that. Nope, that's not right. So this person, I'm constantly, you know, supporting them, giving them that that they didn't have, and they have actually said, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for this guy constantly saying, you can do it. And then they see that I can do it. Me, I'm doing it. And I'm giving them the method, you know, and supporting them. You, you, it's, so you surround yourself by positive people, Absolutely. not the negative people. Absolutely. Say sorry, you're not on my uh, address book anymore. <laughs> and you surround yourself in the, in the environment that will motivate you and... and Keep that passion going. It's very important. That's the gasoline, man, that drives the car. That's what you do so well, Kenny. It's amazing. I've known you a long time, and yeah. you've been consistent. You've always been honest. Your integrity, your humility. It's really <laughs> amazing how you have 
pushed hard. You are an absolute blessing to the music industry, absolutely to the drumming industry. You keep thank on you. going. I love you so much. On behalf of the sessions, we thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks for having me, Dom. Thank you thank so you. much. <laughs> <laughs>